Good morning. Uh, welcome to Sunday morning, the second day of our virtual conference uh, in Brisbane, although I'm in Lismore. Um, today we are going to hear from two speakers, uh, the President of the ASA, Dr Susie New, and also uh, Associate Professor Kirsten Weisasek. Um, the first presentation from Susie is uh, the Jeffrey K. Oration. This is an oration that is uh, the final word from the president at the end of their term uh, with the ASA. Uh, it's a topic of their choice uh, and it's a soapbox for them to stand on. Uh, I have not heard it and I'm assured it could be quite controversial. <laughs> Susie, as you all know, has been the president through a tumultuous time with our profession. I don't need to mention the C word but she has been an amazing campaigner for uh, health and welfare of anaesthetists through this uh, whole pandemic. Um, where she gets her energy from, I don't know, uh, but I have been consistently impressed by her dedication and work rate and effort and intelligence and everything else. So without further ado, Susie New and the Jeffrey K Oration. Thank you, David. Thank you for those very kind words of introduction. As you would know, we have a very unique perspective in this role of the profession, the specialty and society at large. So I'm really honoured to be able to give this oration. Thank you very much to the organising committee. I've titled it Challenges and Cherished Moments. Just, yep. So this oration is named after Geoffrey Kay. He was the first and longest serving secretary of the ASA. He had a great interest in anaesthetic equipment and established the museum, which is now housed at the college. The development of anaesthesia in Australia benefited from, and I quote Gwen Wilson, who, to whom I owe much of this talk, his unique talents in research, teaching and organisation, and his dedication and capacity for hard and unremitting work. On the 19th of January in 1934, Geoffrey Kay and six other men attended the fourth Australasian Medical Congress of the British Medical Association in Hobart. Quite a long title. They stepped away from the Congress and over to this hotel, Hadley's Hotel. There they founded the ASA. This, of course, was followed by much toasting, so much so that they did not make it to the Congress dinner that night and took scant notes the next day. This is very much a cherished moment for the ASA and hopefully for all anaesthetists in Australia. It would have also come with some challenges. The ASA at the time became the fourth medical organisation in Australia. However, this required ultimately a split from the British Medical Association, now called the AMA, an unprecedented but necessary move at the time. In the initial program of this Congress in 1934, anaesthesia was overlooked. Anaesthesia was not yet widely recognised as a branch of medicine. This step of forming our own organisation marked in Australia that anaesthesia, and again I quote Gwen Wilson, had been for so long merely the handmaiden of surgery and, for, and was now itself a science and an art and for its practice, there must be training and teaching. And it would be the newly formed ASA which would steer this course. Since that day in 1934, the annual general meeting, the AGM of the ASA, has almost always been held in conjunction with a Congress, this Congress. Usually this Congress, this Jeffrey K. Oration, the AGM, all occur at the same time and would mark the end of my term. This year, of course, things are a little bit different and it's an exception and I'm very grateful to the NSC and Queensland Anesthesia Continuing Education Committee for this collaboration during challenging times. Did you notice I threw in the theme there? Great theme. So annual general meetings and congresses. These events mark time for organisations such as ours. 
Whilst reflecting on Congresses that have marked my time in this role, there are two moments that I would like to share with you today. The first is the NSC in Sydney, convened by Anne James. It was the Saturday night, a night to recognise and celebrate the hard work of the organising committee a night where we could revel in each other's company without fear of keeping one and a half metres apart and wondering whether the room was adequately ventilated. Do you remember those times? Yeah, we all miss them. That night, I remember chatting with a long time colleague and someone who I very much look up to. She asked me what number female president of the ASA I would be. At that time, I'd actually already been in the role on and off of acting president and president since the start of the year. So I was quite embarrassed that I didn't know the answer, but I quickly looked it up. Five, I'm the fifth woman to be president of the ASA. Mary Burnell was the first woman to be president of the ASA. At the time, the ASA was 19 years old. Her Geoffrey K oration titled The Future of Anesthesia in Australia. In it, she noted that anesthesia was a specialty in Australia that had only begun developing about five years after the ASA was formed. She described the rapid development of the specialty in capital cities. Medical schools did the bulk of the training and medical graduates had the skills to deliver anesthesia to some degree. Postgraduate training opportunities were available, although attracting graduates into the specialty was a challenge. G general practitioners with little or no postgraduate training comprised a significant part of the workforce. With crystal clear clarity, she predicted that they would remain a significant part of the workforce for many years to come. Burnell, however, was one of the first full-time anaesthetists in Australia she didn't combine her work with general practice. At the time, specialist anaesthetists worked in an honorary capacity, that is pro bono in the public hospitals. In fact, you had to have an honorary public appointment to become a member of the ASA. We've certainly moved on from that position and we now welcome pre-vocational doctors, trainees, GPs, anaesthetists and retired members into the ASA. Anaesthetists back then earned their living in private practice. She described this as being on an itinerant basis and at the whim of the surgeons with whom they worked. Established anaesthetizing locations seemed unusual. And she commented that our habit of transporting heavy machines and equipment, perhaps to several places during even one working day is regarded with horror in other parts of the world. She predicted that anaesthetists would combine into anaesthetic groups for the reasons many of us do today. More efficient booking processes, shared economies of office expenses, and to cover for leave or illness. Burnell pointed out that for successful anaesthetic practice, two fundamental attractions are necessary. Abundant and varied clinical opportunities and sufficient financial reward. Professor Alan Merry, in our recent podcast, said that by ensuring sufficient financial reward, we attract good people into the specialty. And we need to attract good people. For as past president John Ashton described in his 1990 Jeffrey Kay oration, the anaesthetist takes responsibility for the patient's anaesthetic single-handed. Many, if not all of us, realize at some point in our careers, the isolation and weight of responsibility that is the nature of anesthetic practice. If the ASA's recent events for pre-vocational doctors are anything to go by, securing a training position has become highly competitive and we are attracting good doctors into the specialty. This is a far cry from 1927 when Jeffrey Kay decided to become an anesthetist. He recalled that at the time, and I quote, there were three specialist anaesthetists in Melbourne. Anaesthetics was then a calling poorly esteemed 
being thought fit for the physically handicapped or for those unsuccessful in other branches of medicine. We have come a long way since then, thankfully, and we are even realising that you can have a physical impairment and still be a great anaesthetist. Mary Burnell was recognised for her uniform post, recognised the need for uniform postgraduate training and according to Gwen Wilson, would often make the laughing claim that the Faculty of Anaesthetists of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons was founded in her living room. This faculty would subsequently lead to the formation of the college. Burnell was the first to realise the importance of an overseas visitor and was largely responsible for development of the ASA's annual overseas visitor program. With the wonders of modern technology and the dedication of Peter Loraway and the organising committee, we're still able to accomplish this at this year's conjoint meeting. Well done. I'm really looking forward to hearing Vern speak. On the 16th of August in 1954, and I highlight the 16th of August because it also happens to be the date that the ASA took ownership of our newest headquarters at 86 Chandos Street, a special meeting of the ASA executive was held. Burnell had only just transitioned from her role of president to immediate past president. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss the future of this beautiful building at 49 Mathura Road, Turak, which was the home of Geoffrey Kay and the headquarters for the ASA. The Overseas Visitor Program, which Burnell founded, was regarded by Kay as diverting funds that were urgently required at 49. For those who are not familiar with this difficult period of the ASA's history, I'll summarise by saying that it left the society without headquarters and a museum. So how did Burnell fare? Her hospitality was legendary, as well as her diplomacy. She would often quietly discuss an awkward question over dinner, only to have it settled without drama at a meeting the next day. She was responsible for instigating many gracious gestures from the society. One example of her leadership was at a meeting to organise the forthcoming Congress, like this Congress. Discussions over one detail were entering into their second hour. She politely interrupted and put it to the chair that as someone who had chaired many committees, she thought the group were getting hungry and suggested that they break for lunch. They did so, came back and resolved the issue in less than 10 minutes. Could then a better resolution have been found for the ASA and Geoffrey Kay under her leadership? I suspect not. And I borrow the words of others here, for Geoffrey Kay was known as a dedicated, hardworking, at times childish idealist, who is also a unique and complex individualist. Mary Burnell was also the first woman dean of the Faculty of Anaesthetists and given the rare honour of being elected to the English Faculty of Anaesthesia. 30 years into the ASA, Margaret McClelland, another paediatric anaesthetist, became the second woman to become president of the ASA. McClelland spent much of her early career in the UK. There she gained skills in thoracic anaesthesia and controlled respiration. She returned to Australia after the Second World War. At the time, she was one of the few qualified and very experienced anaesthetists, so much so that she was sought very highly sought after by the leading surgeons of the day. McClelland achieved international recognition when she became the first full-time director of anaesthesia at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Clinically, she popularised the use of muscle relaxants. And she was the first person to use Karari in a neonate and was involved in the early days of paediatric cardiac surgery. Unfortunately, we don't have a record of her Jeffrey K. oration, but we do have record of her E.H. Embley Memorial Lecture. This was published in the Medical Journal of Australia during her time as president. With efficiency, she acknowledged the milestone work of Embley in describing deaths under anaesthesia due to chloroform. She then outlined the development of anaesthesia from the Victorian pre-anaesthetic times through to mesmerism, the introduction of ether, 
nitrous oxide, cyclopropane, intravenous anaesthetic agents, and halothane. What could be written by others as a dry list of historical anaesthesia medications is instead full of colourful descriptions. Recall that in the Victorian era, surgeons wore leather aprons crusted in blood and pus like a badge of honour. Post-op mortality in some centres was greater than 50%. The better surgeons had to be strong so that they could amputate a leg in seven minutes and they needed to be quick because this was often done without anaesthesia. Can you imagine that? In recounting why it might be strange that the merciful benefits of anaesthesia were not accepted in 1842, she reminds us that at the time, the standard of living, except for that of a privileged group of people was extremely low and few could afford the cost of a doctor's attention. It was a time of child labour when a child as young as six years might be expected to work longer than 10 hours a day. It was a time when public executions were a form of entertainment and it was considered a crime to be poor, a state from which there was no escape. I like her description of Mr Wakeley, who was editor of The Lancet and coroner of London at the time. She said he was a courageous man who fearlessly criticised many of the practices of his day and no one in the medical world, hospital or doctor, was too exalted to escape his acid comments. She concludes her memorial lecture by urging that we must be receptive to new and sometimes disruptive ideas. Disruption. It's a common word we hear today. Ahead of her time, disrupt she did. McClelland was responsible for the introduction of anaesthetic assistance. She advocated for recovery rooms. She supported the introduction of prolonged nasal intubation in the management of sick infants, which subsequently led to the development of paediatric intensive care in Melbourne. She advocated for training and appointed the first purely anaesthetic registrar at the Children's Hospital all things we take for granted today. She studied the impact of better training and assistance on anaesthetic mortality, which not surprisingly declined. McClelland was a founding member of the Faculty of Anaesthetists of the College of Surgeons and played an important part in developing examinations. She was known as a firm but caring and sensitive leader. With warmth and support, she was responsible for training many in anaesthesia in, in Australia and New Zealand in paediatric anaesthesia, a legacy which continues to this day. She received an OBE, the Autumn Medal from the Faculty of Anaesthetists and Honorary Fe um, Fellowship of the Faculty. Pat Mackey was the third woman president of the ASA. The title of her Geoffrey K. oration in 1967 was Frontiers of Anesthesiology. She remarked that the specialty was in a static phase. Graduation from medical school was no longer sufficient to practice as an anaesthetist as it had been in Burnell's time. Specialist training was organised through the faculty as well as through university and hospital departments. As Bunnell predicted, GPs relied upon, as they are now, to deliver anaesthesia across our vast Australian outback. She urged the ASA to undertake more teaching, particularly of GPs and those in remote and regional areas. I hope that if she was with us today, that she will be proud of our recent shift to virtual meetings and the massive increase in online educational offerings from the ASA. She might, like me, want to say that more can be done. Mackie spent a significant part of her Jeffrey K. oration discussing the status of anaesthetists. She noted that conditions were not ideal in private practice. Anaesthetists were hired by the surgeon's receptionist, often receiving poor quality patient referrals, and most patients assumed that anaesthetists were only present for induction. It wasn't also generally appreciated that anaesthetists are also doctors. She predicted that new horizons would not lie in the operating theatre, but in intensive care. 
She talked about the excitement that computers would bring to our work, and we certainly have relied on computers to deliver this Congress. She used the term computer-assisted anaesthesia to describe the use of computers to analyse patient data in real time and warn us when parameters might fall outside of normal limits. Today, we call this continuous monitoring and many a trainee would struggle to give an anaesthetic without it. Mackie predicted the next step would be computer controlled anaesthesia, where decisions on drug administration and the maintenance of physiological conditions would be automated. Trained assistants would attend to technical details. Where would the anaesthetist be in this model? Outside of the operating theatre supervising anaesthetic, several anaesthetics at once. Whilst we're not at this point yet, with the ongoing advances in artificial intelligence and robotics and the threat of task substitution that has been held over our specialty since its formation, I'm not completely certain that one day we won't be replaced by robots. Pat Mackey doesn't include much mention of the ASA in her oration. She considered the society essential, being an independent body that included most anaesthetists in Australia. She called for the ASA to strive to form a college that would be independent from the College of Surgeons. Outside of the society, Mackey was the head of department at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. She valued quality assurance and was involved in the origins of the Australian Patient Safety Foundation. She was awarded the ANSCA Medal, Life Membership of the WFSA, the Centenary Medal of the Order of Australia and the Medal of the Order of Australia. Pat Mackey served as Federal Secretary of the ASA from 1956 to 1961. This was just after the time that Mary Bernell had been president, the loss of Geoffrey Kay from the society, and these were particularly turbulent times for the ASA. The stability that she brought to the society as secretary was no doubt valued and led to her becoming president. She was known for her communication skills, ability to sum up a situation and get to the heart of a matter, as well as making things happen. She was also known for her fairness and support. No doubt these qualities would have helped the ASA through these tough times. And I also suggest that it was involvement with the ASA that might have also provided the opportunity to gain for her to further develop her skills, her fairness and empathy. Both Greta McClelland and Pat Mackey were two Melbourne based women and presidents of the ASA at a time when the society was in crisis. Was this because women are often chosen for leadership roles at challenging times for an organisation when the chance of failure is highest, a phenomenon recently termed the glass cliff? Perhaps, but thankfully for us today, they succeeded in bringing stability to the ASA. So much so that if we accept the glass cliff exists, the next woman to become president of the ASA didn't eventuate until 42 years later. Elizabeth Feeney became president of the ASA on the eve of the ASA's 75th anniversary. Through her editorials of the ASA magazine, now called Australian Anaesthetist, this follows the formation of the National Registration and Accreditation Scheme. Whilst having a single nationwide registration body is attractive, Liz spotted this as the Trojan horse it has become. We are still concerned that this may deny practitioners the right to natural justice. The scheme has expanded into an accreditation body for all specialist training. This may be the biggest existential threat to the college and all medical colleges. It also leaves the door wide open for universities and other educational institutions to train an alternate non-medical anesthesia workforce. Watch this space. I first met Liz at the 2009 National Scientific Congress in Darwin. I was struck by her warmth, which matched our tropical surrounds. I was told of her can-do and supportive attitude, which continues today. I know that if it weren't for our respective lockdowns, she would be here to support me. 
Liz was admitted to the AMA Roll of Fellows and has been awarded the ASA's Gilbert Brown Medal. Mary Burnell, in her Geoffrey Kay oration with great clarity of vision, talked about the future of anaesthesia. Greta McClelland, in her E.H. Embley Memorial Lecture with colourful flair, summarised the history of anaesthesia. Pat Mackey talked of the state of practice with very little mention of the society, whereas Liz Feeney, granted through her editorials, wrote very much about the work of the society in the Australian economic and political context. The issues that Liz mentioned over a decade ago are very much with us today. She announced the arrival of the Medicare Benefits Schedule Review, which reared its head in 2018. At the start of my term, I inherited the tail end of the MBS review. And what David Scott in the most recent Jeffrey K. Oration described as the greatest existential threat to the society for a very long time. What none of us could foresee is what might now be the greatest existential threat to humanity for a very long time. It was certainly an existential threat to this Congress, and it came in the form of a highly contagious and lethal 100 nanometer particle called SARS-CoV-2. All of us have been impacted, whether it be due to lockdown, inability to travel, missing the milestones of friends and family, being infected, exposed, quarantined, facing financial, social and other uncertainties. I share them with you. I do know that we will get through this and we will be stronger for it. For the first time in history, an anaesthetist was on the cover of Time magazine. This was our time. Time for the world to understand who we are and what we do. We showed the world that our role extended beyond the operating theatre. We rearranged our work practices to form intubation teams and provide support to intensive care units, emergency departments and COVID outreach teams. It was with bitterness that despite our adaptation to different models of care and improved recognition, Many of us were not prioritised in the vaccine rollout. I hope we're all vaccinated now. Throughout the pandemic, the ASA was here to support us as clinicians through the challenges that we faced. Within two days of the WHO declaring the pandemic, the Society published our first set of COVID guidelines. We sought collaboration from anywhere and everywhere and in the end had over 20 contributors and involvement from various departments and anesthesia organisations over their 12 revisions. The office team rose to the challenge of designing new web pages, publishing guidelines on a weekly basis and commuting, communicating to members three times a week about COVID related issues. We embarked on fit testing our members and colleagues and made public and private comment on areas not typically within our realm, personal protective equipment, airborne transmission, and public health measures such as lockdowns. Through this, the ASA worked with all levels of government, health departments and hospitals to explore ways elective surgery could continue and balance the conflicting public health needs of restricting movement, whilst not increasing the unmet surgical burden of disease. Past President Ian Stevens in his 1986 Geoffrey Kay oration advised that, we must not accept conditions which do not reach adequate standards, nor must we allow any situation which is not safe for the patient. And to this, the ASA in 2020 loudly added, and which is not safe for the anaesthetist and the team. During the second wave in Victoria, health workers were overrepresented in the number of cases. Over 4,000 of the 20,000 cases occurred in healthcare workers. The overwhelming majority of these infections were acquired in the workplace. Globally, as of May this year, an estimated 115,000 healthcare workers have lost their lives to COVID, and many anaesthetists have left the workforce. 
The society continues to work towards better protection in the workplace. The COVID guidelines were last reviewed in October and already out of date. However, they still stand us in good stead around the negotiation table. We are pleased that finally the National Infection Control Expert Group guidelines have come to resemble the ASA guidelines more closely. There is the adage of never waste a crisis and nothing truer could be said of Cigna and NIB Health with their Honeysuckle Health proposal. This was received by the ACCC on Christmas Eve of last year, the year of the pandemic. The proposed introduction of managed care into Australia may well be the greatest existential threat to the Australian health system. A system that remains one of the best in the world in terms of access, outcomes and affordability. Peter Waterhouse and myself will be talking more about this in a session later today. Earlier in this oration, I shared with you the challenges and cherished moments of the ASA through the lens of the writings of the women presidents. Whilst none of the founding members of the ASA were women, from the outset, women have been members and have held office at state and federal level. The equality of status enjoyed by women in Australia, in anaesthesia in Australia, was very different to the rest of the world. This gender equality was, was pointed out to us in 1969 by our overseas visitor, Professor Emmanuel Papa of Columbia University. It prompted two papers to be presented. Gwen Wilson, author of one of those papers, thought the subject, and I quote her, the subject of gender equality was one which would never have occurred to me, nor I am sure any anaesthetist in Australia, as worthy of comment. The other paper was presented in 1972 by Tess Brophy Cramond, a familiar name to many, especially in Queensland. She had been Federal Secretary of the ASA in 1969 and the second woman to be elected Dean of the Faculty of Anaesthetists. She reported that 12.5% of ASA members were women and there had been three female presidents, three federal secretaries, two awarded life membership and one awarded the Gilbert Brown Medal. This slide shows the equivalent information as of today. Five of the 40 life memberships of the ASA have been awarded to women. Two of the 13 Gilbert Brown Medal recipients are women. Women account for 52% of medical students and make up 45% of anaesthesia trainees, as they do our ASA trainee members. The graph on the right shows the percentage of women in trainee, working and retired member categories. These figures are from the 2020 report to the board, a report which is now provided on an annual basis and is available on the website. If leadership positions are anything to go by, then anaesthesia during my term has been well placed when it comes to gender equality. I've had the immense pleasure of befriending and being supported by an unprecedented network of female presidents in my time. Yannicka Mellon Olson from the WFSA, Linda Mason, Mary Dow Peterson, Beverly Phillips from the US, Catherine Hagen, Sheila Hart from New Zealand, Kathleen Ferguson, who in 2018 was the first ever woman to be president of the Association of Anesthetists, Dolores McKean from Canada, Idit Matot from Israel, and Theresia Chavera, the inaugural president of the Anesthesiologist Society of Namibia. What a fantastic club to be a part of. Recent developments by the ASA have included a policy to support committee members, male or female, who are parents of young children. That's right, we will pay for babysitting or whatever support it is that you need for you to be able to attend committee meetings. We also published the first ever edition of Australian Anesthetists that was solely focused on gender equality and we formed a gender equity working group. There's been some great progress, but more still needs to be done. With this, I want to revisit another Congress, another AGM, another cherished moment. This time it's the 2018 NSC. It's the eve of me becoming vice president. I want to play an audio excerpt from a piece I wrote at the time.
It was the Saturday night of the NSC in Adelaide. Breaking with tradition, the gala dinner had been moved to this night rather than the usual Monday night. This change meant that, amongst other things, it would precede the AGM. Thus, I could still be incognito, except for a few in the know about the new role I was about to enter. With quiet confidence, I kissed my family goodnight and headed over to the dinner, alone. The confidence came from knowing that soon I was going to be vice president of this organisation. This organisation that was hosting this dinner. That was hosting this conference. I felt trusted. This male-dominated profession, organisation, with two-thirds of members being men, had accepted and recognised me as one of their future leaders. I could quietly enjoy this knowledge without the wider membership knowing, without having to make any formal speeches or presentations, without having to consider what I said or wonder if there was a hidden agenda in someone approaching me. No, I could be myself, relax, and also feel a little bit invincible. The night began really well. I found two other stragglers making their way through the crowd of returnees from the monster truck show. I quickly jumped into the slipstream and we formed a peloton through the sea of families. I made my way to my assigned table, greeted my fellow diners and soon was engaged in fascinating conversation with the partner of a committee chair. I was impressed how he had immediately introduced himself as another man's partner without a hint that this was anything other than normal. I was patting the society, the membership on the back. Yes, this is the society I know. A big family where all are respected and welcomed. After two courses of entertaining conversation, I joined the many others who had left their tables and went roaming in search of friends I hadn't yet seen. Very soon I was chatting amongst friends and acquaintances. The very few that knew congratulated me unofficially on my new role. The great many that didn't know I enjoyed catching up with from within my anonymity. I use these moments to talk about all things, but I really enjoyed it when we got talking about the ASA. At the back of my mind, I wondered if we could have such a frank conversation in a few days' time after the AGM and once the news became public. The band had truly warmed up by now and people started filling the dance floor. During a lull in our conversation, I heard the band enticing people to the floor by mentioning that this would be the only slow song for the night. One of the men in our group responded that he wouldn't mind taking me for a dance. I chose to ignore him. The conversation and laughs rolled on before I spotted someone I hadn't seen for a while and made the usual end of conversation murmurings. Before I left, he came to me and again expressed his desire to dance with me. This time in a low, deep, grumbling voice that came straight from the groin and was accompanied by a whack to my bum. The future vice president's bum. This occurred in 2018, the year which saw the rise of the Me Too movement, a social movement against sexual harassment and assault. This year, in 2021, this movement, this social movement, has to many become a deafening roar. Elizabeth Broderick, Australia's longest serving sex discrimination commissioner and current chair rapporteur of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls, and Grace Tame, who I hope needs no introduction, roar loud and clear, so I wish to let them speak here. By way of forewarning, these are stirring words, which may trigger deep emotions for some of us. If you suspect this might apply to you, then I encourage you to silence this next bit and join back in at the next slide. On January the 25th this year, a young woman named Grace Tame from Tasmania, which also happens to be my birthplace, she became our Australian of the Year. Grace told the story of how at school she'd been subjected to years of grooming and sexual ab abuse by her maths teacher the very person she'd gone to for advice when she was struggling at home. And together with others, she'd campaigned to change the law in Tasmania, which up until just last year 
had prevented women from telling their own stories of abuse in their own words at a time of their own choosing. So on that fateful day on the 25th of January, in her address to the nation, Grace said, When we share, we heal. I remember him saying, don't tell anybody. I remember him saying, don't make a sound. Well, hear me now, using my voice amongst a growing chorus of voices that will not be silenced. Will not be silenced. I further borrow words from Elizabeth Broderick. This call set off a string of events. A month after this speech by Grace Tame, Brittany Higgins came forward to tell her story of rape allegedly perpetrated against her in the highest offices of this country. This was followed by a further three women who came forward with their stories of alleged sexual abuse by the same perpetrator. Not long after, Chantelle Contos, a woman from a prestigious girls' school, detailed on Instagram her story of sexual assault as a 13-year-old schoolgirl. Within weeks, she had received over 5,000 testimonies of sexual assault. We have entered a discussion that crosses the political spectrum and crosses socioeconomic divides. We are realizing that men, women, all genders are in this together. Jeffrey Kay was an idealist. Maybe I too am an idealist in that one day I hope that our committees our members, our future presidents, and our communities are as inclusive as they are diverse. Unlike many before me, I went to a regular co-ed public high school. I'm a first generation immigrant and I didn't learn to speak English until I started school. I was briefly a director of an anesthesia department, but certainly not in the league of Greta McClelland and Pat Mackey. When it was first mentioned, and even up to the time that it became reality, it surprised me that I might ever be considered for the role of president. Once I accepted this invitation, I made it my goal to serve the ASA to the best of my ability. Thank you for trusting me with this role. I hope I have served you well. The late past president, John Richards, in his Jeffrey Kay oration, reminded us that Jeffrey Kay helped found this society on the principles of unity and friendship. It has been an honour to work with the board, council, committee members, secretariat and members of the ASA. We have shared together our diverse views, worked to find unity and created many, many friendships. There have been challenges, and growth, but many more cherished moments because of these friendships. Although I never met John in person, we exchanged letters and he, a gracious past president, offered me a new fresh faced president, this piece of advice. Above all, have fun. Well, it has been a lot of fun, a privilege and an honor serving you as president of the ASA. I still have 11 weeks of my term left, so I hope you will join me at the AGM for the last of this story and to welcome in the new president. On that note, I do finally want to make one announcement. When I became a board member, I was given a lapel pin, which I have proudly worn in my official duties here and overseas. At the time it was given to me, a comment was made that new board members would usually also receive a tie, but that it may not be appropriate for me. So from the birthplace of the ASA in Hobart, I'm delighted to share with you these. I must thank past president John Haynes, designer of the beloved hand holding the bowl of vapors logo for planting the seed in my mind. John, I hope you approve. 
Now we have some logo inspired jewelry, a necklace, earrings, a lapel or tie pin and some cufflinks are on the way. Handmade in Hobart, the birthplace of the ASA and finished with sustainably farmed Tasmanian heart blackwood. I hope that they will be worn in unity and gifted in friendship during our challenging times and our cherished moments. Thank you. And thank you, Susie. Uh, when I first met Susie as a junior many years ago, I thought, here is a woman of incredible ability, intelligence and drive. And I have to say, Susie, I was not at all surprised when your name came forward as uh, the person who'd be our future president. And I once again want to reiterate what an outstanding job I feel you've done in leading the society through what has been a very challenging time for a number of reasons, um, many of which you've highlighted. And I also want to thank you for bringing forward the uh, importance of women in our in our specialty and also the importance of um, the Me Too movement. I, I think it's a really important time and in a way we change the way we view our world. Um, with, with that, Thank you, Madam President. Oh, by the way, I also I'm looking forward to getting one of those pins. They look really good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>